Good morning. So those are actually uh, very good lead-ins to what I want to talk about now, which is um, about whether um, the forces that bring big data to us, that enable big data, um, also may change the way we actually do science itself, in addition to rethinking how we do consent, rethinking how we do governance of research projects, might we have to rethink the process of research? So there are a lot of forces that we've already talked about a lot through the course of this conference that have to do with um, the convergence of technology, information, science, and other uh, processes, social processes through the world, globalization and commercialization of research um, that are all moving together to enable what we are talking about as big data science, um, the gathering of lots of data and the ability to analyze it, not even not just by scientists as we know them, but by uh, people um, who have pot potentially no training in formal training in science. Um, and also commercialization, as you probably know, most the vast majority of biomedical research today, at least as measured by dollars, is not done in academia, but is done by commercial, the commercial sector. Um, and so we are already facing a number of challenges in biomedical research, and so this shift and rethinking of how we do science may actually solve some of the problems that we have that are facing biomedical research right now. And we've heard some of these through the course of the last couple of days. Um, one is uh, trying not to um, continue to have underserved populations who are unrepresented in research and in medicine. Um, also problems that face data sharing, technical, legal, and social, including things like intellectual property that are barriers to sharing data. Um, reproducibility of data, uh, which was, and validity of data, as well as dissemination and cost. And we've, again, heard some about some of this before. Um, so, for example, there are many studies that have started to look at how reproducible science is, and in this uh, diagram you can see that the large part of the pie is a set of um, experiments that somebody tried to replicate and was in unable to replicate these um, on drug target studies. The little tiny blue uh, wedge of the pie there um, represents those that they could replicate. So you can see this is a, a major challenge. And as well, Kathy Hudson mentioned yesterday that um, a large proportion of uh, biomedical research is not published. And indeed, um, one of the faculty members here at Stanford, John Ioannidis, has stated that most published research findings are actually false. So um, maybe science is broken already. Um, but maybe also some of the changes that we've heard about in the scientific process may serve to help fix some of these problems. Um, on the other hand, I think there are also some trends that look, uh, that look like there are certain divergences as well as convergences. And these divergences may be um, a misalignment of values in how science is done, um, both in terms of dis differences between public values and scientific values in terms of what the benefits are, what it means to have a benefit from science and who benefits, as well as possible divergences in um, public values and regulatory frameworks as far as how risk is defined. Um, and I'm mostly going to talk about this first thing, about the divergence in terms of benefits. So I'm just going to give you an example of this. Um, and this is um, from a, a study that we did of uh, a group called the Interagency Autism Coordinating uh, committee, which is a federal committee that decides how to allocate and use a uh, billion dollars for uh, autism research and services that are provided by the federal government and authorized by the Combating Autism Act. Um, and this group includes, uh, by law, people who are not scientists to decide how to prioritize research um, through a strategic plan that they come up with every year. Um, and so one example that we found of a, um, uh, a, an instance where the people, um, the public actually were able to contribute to the prioritization decisions made by this committee um, were uh, documented. Uh, and it specifically had to do with how they prioritized a particular research question um, about children with autism who tend to wander off 
and this is technically called elopement. Um, but this issue of wandering was first raised in 2010 in April by somebody at a public comment meeting of the IACC. Um, and six months later, the committee actually agreed to recommend adding that as an objective in the strategic plan. Uh, then six months after that, the IACC coordinated with a group to conduct a study of uh, wandering and elopement. Um, six months after that, there was actually a new ICD-9 code that was developed for wandering and was officially uh, added um, in order to facilitate research on this uh, topic. And uh, a, this new research objective was added in the 2012 strategic plan. And by October in 2012, a survey was published uh, based on the work that had been initiated the year before and published in the, published in the journal Pediatrics. So that's a pretty stunningly fast um, turnaround time for developing a research question, actually conducting a study, and getting it published. Uh, and that was all done with the instigation of basically lay people, people who are not professional scientists, who added this to a research agenda that scientists would have never done uh, on their own. However, there were many criticisms of uh, this committee, uh, and so some people have expressed concerns with this process. Um, so here are some quotes that were on a blog by a group called The Age of Autism, which I'll come back to at the end. Um, some of these statements say that the panel is excessively focused on early intervention, little focuses on services, significant overinvestment in genetic and genomic research, um, and that there isn't enough attention to environmental causation. There were also concerns with the process. They say that there's no accountability, that there are conflicts of interest, um, unrepresentative body of committee members, and are arguing that the IACC has not been effective. And I'll come back to these issues at the end. Um, okay, so I think some of the examples that we've seen here in this conference are really representing a deprofessionalization of science. Um, and so one of the things that I'll come back to later and that we, I think, will need to think about in the future is that's, that has advantages, but it may also have disadvantages. And I think we need to sort of enter this new potential new world and think about both of those things and how we might need to um, act in order to minimize the, the negative consequences. But some of the good things that we think, I think we've heard about are the way that technologies uh, contribute to bringing people together and, in fact, allowing themselves to define themselves differently. Um, this term biosociality refers to the ability of people to define themselves by biological characteristics, create new identities. We heard that yesterday. You might uh, define yourself by having a specific variant of NGLY1, for example. Um, or DIY movements, do-it-yourself movements. There's a group called DIY Bio that does biological experiments themselves at home. Um, and also, we heard many examples of people who are not professional scientists prioritizing funding, collecting data, analyzing the data, uh, and publishing it, uh, just like professional scientists do. And some people take pretty low-tech uh, approaches to this or high-tech approaches to this, such as using mobile devices. And so, uh, we heard yesterday that wonderful example of Eterna, um, and some of the other um, uh, examples of people being able to basically crowdsource not just data collection but analysis. Uh, and there are many examples of this, as well as groups such as um, Patients Like Me. Is anybody here from Patients Like Me or have heard about this group? So um, there's a difference, though, between, I think, some of these groups in the extent to which uh, uh, and the role played by professional scientists relative to the people who are not professional scientists. So one of the things that distinguishes these is who gets to decide what the research project is. Um, and so this is an example from uh, patients like me, which points out that um, in some of these groups, the trial participants actually hold the power. They decide what research 
uh, gets done and on what data and um, publish it themselves. So this was actually published, a paper that was published uh, in the B British Medical Journal by um, uh, patients like me, which is a group of patients that shares their own data from clinical trials and analyzes it on questions that they decide. And this is a quote from that paper, which I thought I'd point out because I think this does point to the issue of trust that Jane mentioned just, uh, just now. It says, the social contract of the randomized controlled trial is imbalanced. Patients adhere to arduous protocols, are randomized to placebo, and are blinded to health status. Although most participants would like a lay summary of results, only a minority receive one. With the remainder left the option of paying around $30 to read the results once the study is published in a peer-reviewed journal. So you can see that this is uh, you know, a group of people that have taken things into their own hands uh, and decided that if they are being left out of the benefits, the potential benefits of research, they're going to do the research themselves. And in the process of that, they actually look just like professional scientists. They have CVs and they have publications. And this is one of their publications in Nature Biotechnology based on data uh, that they uh, shared amongst themselves and then analyzed. However, what something that's different here is that Patients Like Me is a company. So here's a quote from their website, um, which is a very transparent website, and it says, how does Patients Like Me make money? And you can see here it says, we take the information patients like you share about your experience with the disease and sell it to our partners, um, i.e. companies that are developing or selling products to patients. These products may include drugs, devices, equipment, insurance, and medical services. So this is a bit of a different model than uh, what we think of as the traditional academic medical research model. So I want to go back to the age of autism just to bring up another ethical issue and sort of come back to the, the, the question of what, uh, what is good and what is bad about this new, way, new ways of doing research that might involve um, basically the deprofessionalization of the, the, the act of doing science. So here's a quote. Um, this is from the Age of Autism uh, uh, website, which is a newspaper, a web newspaper of the autism epidemic, as they call it. And this is the rationale for this newspaper. It says, we are published to give voice to those who believe autism is an environmentally induced illness that is treatable and that children can recover. For the most part, the major media in the United States aren't interested in that point of view. They won't investigate the causes and possible biomedical treatments of autism independently. And they don't listen to the most important people, the parents, many of whom have witnessed autistic regression and medical illness after vaccination. So this raises the whole question, which is a very epistemological question, is you know, who, what, what is the value of having um, hypotheses um, and, and how do scientists have hypotheses and how do those hypotheses act in the process of their doing science? Um, and are these hypotheses actually biases? So this is something that we all have to question all the time as we're doing the process, we're doing, uh, engaged in science. Um, but I think it's uh, examples like this that sort of sharpen the point on this. Um, so just to finish up here, I think that these um, changes that we're seeing that are enabled by technology uh, and um, the ability for vast numbers of people to participate in science may, it may actually be necessary to do big data science. We, it may not be possible to gather enough data and analyze it just by leaving this as something that is done just in the professional sphere. However, I think it does raise some ethical issues um, that are common to all, all is, uh, that are common to doing science no matter who does it, um, including is it democratizing, but is it more just? Is it just people who have iPhones and computers who can do this? Um, is it exploitation of people who are giving their labor, um, providing cheap labor, but not getting acknowledged or paid? Um, who's accountable for this? Uh, how do we deal with financial and non-financial conflicts of interest, including conflicts of interest maybe of ideology? Um, how do we, do we depend on self-regulation and codes of ethics, or do we need different regulatory frameworks? Because the current regulatory frameworks assume a certain power balance between researchers and research participants that may not hold true. Who decides what and how science is produced, and will it be good or better than it is now? So uh, with that, I will um, thank you, and I think we'll move on. <laughs>